Well, welcome, and we have a very special guest. I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Leonard Moore, and we, um, um, who is here in Santa Monica as a, an invited guest speaker. Mm -hmm. And Kevin Anderson from Maryland said, I have a guy <laughs> who will be so valuable, yeah. uh -huh. but he can make some people uncomfortable. Yeah. Do you yeah. hear that? I hear it a lot. Well, yeah. I guess first off, uh -huh. You're from the University of Texas. Right, Let right. us know what you do there. And then so we'll I'm a there. history professor. Uh, I think I'm pretty popular. I teach a couple classes. My classes typically have 500 to 600 students. Teach courses on black politics. The classes are very diverse. Um, and I'm also a senior associate VP. But at my heart, I'm a professor at heart. You know what I mean? There is no greater joy to me than walking into the classroom and having 550 students there ready to go. Well, and you're probably, I would say probably from what I've heard, you're one of the few professors that you get more people coming to That's classes, right? People, right? And now they people, don't drop <laughs> off, they grow. Right. People aren't even enrolled in the class. Yeah. yeah. So it's a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. Okay. So get back to uh -huh. why, why you can make the room sort of uncomfortable, but in a good way. Yeah. Yeah. So um, the issue of race. Yeah. Uh -huh. And obviously in our, our country, mm -hmm. I mean, it's not just, but in college sports is what right. we're talking about this week. And uh, when, when you think about um, the landscape coming out of what we've seen at places like Missouri mm -hmm. and some of these things, where are we right now? Where do you size up race and the collegiate sports environment? I think that college athletic directors and university presidents and board of trustees have to start uh, being honest with themselves about what they are bringing to campus, about how the lifeblood of this billion dollar industry are uh, primarily black boys and black girls, 16 to 17 years of age. Um, but I know as a white person, it can be delicate to talk about race. I, I completely understand. And so I thank you for this forum where we can be somewhat transparent. And, and uh, I don't really like political correctness. And I understand that people have questions, they want answers, but they are afraid if I ask the question the wrong way, mm -hmm. are you gonna call me a racist? You know what I'm saying? So. Yeah. We just have to start creating forums where people can be themselves, knowing that we all have biases. Mm -hmm. uh, and, mm -hmm. and kind of to your point in that, and you mm -hmm. talked about, you know, you say you have a coach or somebody says, oh, I don't see color. And, that, right. and, and they're well-intentioned of saying, oh, I see, but it's okay. To, I mean, That's you, right. They need to recognize it. For instance, I, I have, uh, after Trump was elected, I made it a point to connect with my Muslim students in the class, you know, the, particularly the women who were wearing the hijab and things of that nature not stereotyping them, but it's like, hey, there's a lot going on. There's a lot of anti-Muslim hysteria in America. How are you doing? Mm -hmm. And we need athletic directors to sometimes ask these black kids on these predominantly white campuses, hey, how are you doing? So not in a stereotypical fashion, but just as a way of uh, letting the student know that you understand. Mm -hmm. As sort of a backdrop, uh -huh. can you kind of summarize when you talk about some of the statistics yeah. on the disproportionate okay. number of... I have a great one. Yeah. If you look at the Power Five conferences. Yes. And I would say if you watch a Power Five conference, football, basketball game, women's basketball game, track and field, 80% of the participants will probably be African-American. Um, of all the Power Five conferences, all 60 schools, the black male enrollment at all those schools averages about 2.5%. And so you don't have a black male presence on the campus at all but you have a black male presence in athletic. So it's just this over-representation, mm -hmm. particularly in football and basketball, but a much, but an under-representation once you look at the classroom and the broader campus. What, what dynamic does that, or what challenge does that create really for all, I mean, for the, the student athletes, right. for the, I mean, what? Do, what it does for, for, the, for, I would say, the white kid and the Asian kid, it, it stereotypes all black college kids as if they're football players. I remember being a professor at LSU going to the library one Friday, I may have had on jeans and a shirt, and I'm walking out of the library, and a student says, good luck tomorrow. <laughs> I'm like, what the hell are you talking about? You thought I was on a football team. Yeah. You, you know what I mean? Yeah. But now I understand if every black person on campus they interact with plays football, basketball, or is on the track team, then you do get this sort of stereotypical view of black people that we are only on the campus for what we can bring athletically. Okay, so given that, given that there's this disproportionate mm -hmm. number, mm -hmm. 
what is not being talked about? What are we sort of glossing over mm -hmm. for this large population in, in order, you know, we talk about, and, and I will say, and, and I, so many mm -hmm. athletic directors say, you know, it's all about the student athlete. And right. I, I firmly believe in their heart, they feel that mm -hmm. way. And I'm saying in a general sense, say, <laughs> but what is not being addressed in a, um, you know, in the enterprise that you feel? We like, will spend, some of these Power Five programs will spend $300,000 to hire a wide receiver coach or 60 grand to hire these analysts. These, 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 you know, these coaching staff have just ballooned over the last few years. But you won't put any money into character development, into, I would say, diversity training. And I mentioned in the session yesterday, y'all want Dr. Moore to come for free. Because you don't value, you really don't value it. You know what I mean? But as Missouri showed us and hopefully showed these athletic directors, every school is once incident away. And once it happens, the AD is gone. Mm -hmm. Once it happens, the AD is gone. What we saw in Missouri, the chancellor of the Missouri system got fired. The AD's the only one who wasn't That's gone because right. he was brand new. <laughs> took, took another job, right. <laughs> and the president of that particular campus got fired and, and the football coach retired indoor left. And so if nothing else uh, wakes up athletic directors, it's the threat of boycott. And it's the threat of this, this, this political mobilization, the Colin Kaepernick effect. And what I'm trying to get athletic directors to understand is that your head coach can't control it. And athletic directors, they, they don't want to get involved they want to let the head coach handle, quote, their team. But I'm like, no, that kid is in your department. Mm -hmm. And that's why I need athletic directors to step up, you know, in many ways and be a little bit more bold and be a little bit more progressive at addressing issues of race. Do you, I, I think, um, privately, a lot of people will say they think in the next few years, I mean, that, that, that boycott, I mean, do you mm -hmm. think a boycott will happen? Oh, without a doubt. I mean, I think the system is two or three years away from completely turning on its head. And that's why I tell the athletic directors, quit trying to defend a system that doesn't work. You know it doesn't work. They remind me of the tobacco lawyers. You know what I mean? You, if you say it long enough, you say, well, no, uh, smoking doesn't cause cancer. You know what I'm saying? Just admit what you got and let's try to find a way to reform the system where it works for everybody. So what are, um, and you know, one of the things I thought was very interesting too mm -hmm. is the dynamic between the black student athletes yes. and the black non-athlete right. population on campus. Because think about it, Katie, they come, to the, they come to the campus through different doors. Mm -hmm. the, the regular black students had to apply, fill out an application, hope they got in, trying to get some scholarship money. Whereas a student athlete was recruited to go there when he was 15 or she was 15 or 16. So there is a division once they get on campus and partly it's because the black student athlete is so isolated from the rest of the campus. Mm -hmm. So the black student athletes don't feel like they're necessarily part of the black community. And the black students say, well, you think y'all think y'all better than us. You know, so it, there is a lot of tension and division there. And on some campuses, it's gotten physical, particularly with, you know, males on the football team and just rails in the general, males in the general black student population. That's fascinating to you, isn't it? I, it's really fascinating yes. to me. Yes. It really uh -huh. is. I mean, that, I, 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 H here's the analogy I gave yesterday. If I play football at Florida State or Texas or Ohio State, I can go to the white fraternity party and be treated like a god, mm -hmm. all right? And at some universities, these white fraternities will have the media guide. They, they almost recruit them because they want them. That's right. They'll there, have a media right? guide at the front door, and if you're black and you don't play basketball or football, you can't get in. But if you play a sport, get in, drink all you want. But if I'm a black athlete and I go to a black fraternity party, it's like, man, you know, you know you, you're, you're just one of us. You got to pay. And they aren't being treated royally. So that's where a lot of the disconnect comes in That Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes, okay. so that makes complete sense. Uh -huh. One of the other things that I found very interesting, well, because as we get in this conversation, there's been a lot of talk about the value of the scholarship and this right. whole pay for play and right. that, that whole right. um, conversation that mm -hmm. has been happening for the last couple of years. And you hear mm -hmm. sometimes like, this is a, a privilege, right? This right. is a privilege. For, <laughs> and I found your comments about yes. that very interesting and, and, and the example you used. So, I mean, the example I give is that, and I told these ADs yesterday and coaches, quit telling these kids it's a privilege to play here. You recruited them for three years. And that's like me, Katie, inviting you to dinner at my house like 15 times and you finally come. And I say, well, Katie, you know it's a privilege for you to be here. You're like, damn, Leonard, you invited me. <laughs> and, and also when we talk about the value of the scholarship, at the education is only value. It, it only has value if I value it. Here's my analogy. I was, give, I was upgraded to a first class ticket once. I don't value sitting in first class. 
To me, I could sit and coach. I'm going the same place. But in the eyes of the airline, they did a big thing for you. But I don't. But I didn't value that. You, yeah. you see what I mean? Yeah. And so I think sometimes those of us who have middle class norms, black, white, Latino, otherwise, we may value the college degree because we see the benefit of it. But if I'm coming from a family where nobody has ever been to college and I've never really seen education pay off, then that I don't I don't find value in that. That's not part of your story. And That's I, right. I, I chuckled at the dinner thing, not because it's funny, but it, it, it sounds so ludicrous when you size yes. it up that way. But what happens, though, Katie, is that when these kids are getting recruited, they have the upper hand. Mm -hmm. These coaches will, will leave their family. They will go to these kids' games. They, they will do anything they have to do, answering texts in the middle of the night to get a kid. But once a kid signs, this begins to process, Katie, what we call de-recruiting. So now the coach has to kind of get the power back from this kid who's had the power for the last three years. And they'll say crazy stuff like that. You know, it's a privilege for you to be here. And all that. And there are 40 guys who will come re replace you tomorrow. It's like, well, coach, you, you, you sent me over 400 text messages in two years, you know? <laughs> yeah. So I guess to kind of bring this back yeah. around, whether it's an athletic director or somebody who works in an athletic mm -hmm. department or aspires to, if you could kind of get to the top three things or so th mm -hmm. that you would like to see right. where attention going, changes made, mm -hmm. things to some actionable things that athletic right. departments to do mm -hmm. could do to, to be proactive about right. this, what would those be? I need athletic directors to start doing their job. I need them to start meeting with the black student athletes, meet with a representative group of them, not when there is a crisis, but just a standing monthly meeting, hey, I'm trying to find out what's going on, how are you feeling, how's the climate on campus? Number two, they have to hire staff that are racially diverse. Mm -hmm. um, at a lot of these institutions, uh, these young men, and they don't see any men, men and women, they don't see anybody who works in athletics who looks like them. But the funny thing is, they, when they're recruited, they're talking about the alumni network and the connections. We don't see that work for black athletes. And number three, we need them to be just as focused on post-graduation outcomes as they are on getting those kids to campus. Because too often, and we say this in, and in my frank terminology, once your eligibility is up, you are kicked off the plantation. And the former black student athlete has no value and is the most useless person on a college campus. So the, we do those three things, we'll be okay. Dr. Moore, thank you mm -hmm. so much for being here mm -hmm. and for sharing a lot for mm -hmm. all of us to think about.